This protester calls himself Bruce. Put the hand down! We've hidden his face and obscured his voice to protect his identity. He's one of the millions of Hong Kongers taking to the streets. Many people here are wearing face masks. People are hiding their identities. They fear that the government will press charges. What started as a protest against an extradition bill has become the most serious challenge to the Communist Party's authority since the Tiananmen Square protest three decades ago. As the demonstrations enter a third month, neither the government nor the protesters is willing to back down. Police fire tear gas, rubber bullet, and use their police baton to hit the protester. But it's not enough to deter the demonstrators. So what happens now? This is a real nightmare for the communist government in Beijing. They can either crush Hong Kong or they can tolerate being defied in a way that undermines everything about their whole structure of government. They have no good choices. Hong Kong is one of the most important financial centers in the world, and it has a unique status. It's a city in China, but it's not entirely Chinese. It has its own currency, its own passport, its own legal system. There's even a boundary between Hong Kong and the rest of China, and you need a permit to cross it. This is all down to its history. In 1842, Hong Kong was ceded by the Chinese to the British after the First Opium War. But in 1997, Britain gave it back to China. Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. With one important condition. For 50 years, Hong Kong was to be governed under what is known as one country, two systems. The chief executive who runs Hong Kong would be appointed by a pro-Chinese committee. But the city was guaranteed a high degree of autonomy with its own government, legal system and economic independence until 2047. Over the past decade, those rights have been eroded. Fuller democracy, promised as part of the handover agreement, has yet to be granted by China. Yellow ribbon means come back, come back democracy. Emily Lau was a Hong Kong politician for 25 years. Today, she still campaigns for democracy. Things have deteriorated fast, particularly since President Xi Jinping came to power. <laughs> So people are very concerned. We want freedoms, we want personal safety, we want the rule of law. China's grip has got ever tighter. In 2012, the government tried to install a patriotic pro-Chinese education system. Then five Hong Kong booksellers who sold material banned in mainland China disappeared. In 2016, pro-democracy opposition leaders were thrown out of Hong Kong's parliament for insulting China when swearing their oaths. And then in February this year, the government introduced a bill which would have allowed extradition to the mainland. Very few people in Hong Kong imagine there's going to be full-on Western-style democracy, but they are very angry about the way that what they believe they were promised was something much more accountable where you'd have something close to universal suffrage. The basic social contract between the people of Hong Kong and their government is breaking down. All this is fueling the protesters' anger. The invisible hand from China are getting more visible. They are putting more controls on Hong Kong's autonomy, uh, democracy. Hong Kong is not China. People will say to you, we know that 2047 is coming one day, but we don't want it to happen now. As the protests get larger and more violent, the chance of China intervening increases. Beijing has made thinly veiled threats to send in its military forces, the People's Liberation Army. A few weeks ago, nobody seriously thought we could see another Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong. Now, you can't rule it out. In 1989, 
A student demonstration in Beijing ended in massacre. Hundreds, maybe thousands, were shot dead. For the Chinese government, the Hong Kong demonstrators are defying the authority of a communist leadership that cannot tolerate defiance. For President Xi Jinping, his kind of north and south, his east and west, is the absolute authority and total control of the Chinese Communist Party, and anything that threatens that must be crushed. They're afraid that it could be very infectious, and they don't want to see such marches in the other parts of mainland China. Another fear is some protesters' demand for full independence. But military intervention would be a very risky strategy for Beijing. Hong Kong, for all its woes, is still a very rich world financial center. Uh, to roll troops into that kind of a financial center would be an economic catastrophe. In 1993, Hong Kong's GDP accounted for more than a quarter of mainland China's. Today, China's remarkable rise means that Hong Kong's economic output makes up less than 3% of the mainland's. But Hong Kong remains important for China. Multinationals use it as a launch pad to the mainland, and it gives Chinese companies access to the rest of the world. So we are very special. We are a window for China to look to the outside world. As an international city with all our connections, it's very valuable to China. So how the turmoil is resolved matters to more than just the people of Hong Kong. The government there said, you know, the People's Liberation Army may be deployed. But if that's the case, the game is over. If China uses lethal force, then you would see an economic crash. There's 85,000 American expatriates in Hong Kong. You'd see them fleeing for the airport. This all comes at a time when China and America are waging a trade and technology war. Bloodshed on Hong Kong streets would make relations deteriorate even further. Beijing is now blaming outsiders for the trouble. We've seen remarkably explicit state media commentaries telling the people of China that these protests are not just radical and violent, but are also orchestrated by foreign forces. For the Chinese Communist leadership, what's happening in Hong Kong is evidence that as China rises as one of the world's most powerful countries, that the West is using every means possible to divide and to frustrate China. For China, the situation has become much more than a dispute over a law. It's become an existential threat. Bruce and the other protesters are holding their breath. I am still wary of what happened next because the situation could deteriorate very rapidly. China's communist rulers must choose between two mortal dangers, the collapse of economic stability and prosperity, or the acceptance that protests can limit the party's absolute power. Hi, I'm Anna. I directed this film. If you'd like to find out more about the situation in Hong Kong and its relationship with China, click on the link to The Economist website. You can also watch our film about China's oppression of the Muslim Uyghurs. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.